I should probably start by pointing out to everyone who's new to this channel, I don't pick on China. I criticize every aspect of capitalism and imperialism, and usually I focus on North America. Most of my criticism of China I apply to the US every day. I'd also like to point out there's nothing wrong with criticizing a state wherever you're from, as long as your criticism is fair and valid. While I may have any kind of theoretical criticisms of any state anywhere, some deserve more criticism than others. But there are a couple of added pitfalls when talking about China. For one thing, uh, whatever your intentions, it's always possible there's some racism underlying your thinking. For example, if you criticize China for detaining Uyghurs en masse, that's probably a valid criticism. But if you can find an excuse for the U.S. doing the same thing with immigrants, you better check what it is you're actually criticizing and what you're actually against. <laughs> Why the double standard? They both represent the destruction of freedom in people's lives. Criticize both. Or, ideally, organize to stop both. That's a bit harder. There's no need for a double standard when you have principles. I'd also like to be clear about my purpose here. Many people on the left, which means anti-capitalist, so not liberals, just socialists and other radicals, see China as a socialist state that, while maybe not completely socialist, is at least making advances towards socialism and communism. They stick up for the Communist Party of China, or CPC, in its actions, even when they're to the detriment of the workers leftists claim to support. A lot of them seem to think the CPC is socialist because it calls itself socialist. Because governments don't lie, unless their claims don't match their actions and the outcomes of their policies don't match the rhetoric with which they were implemented, then they lie, sure. This video is to convince you present-day China is capitalist, and there's no reason for so socialists to support the CPC. I lived in China for two years, and I lived in Taiwan for a couple of years, too. I speak and read Chinese at, I don't know, an intermediate level. I like a lot of things I know about China and Chinese culture. It's influenced me quite a bit, I'd say. Uh, based on what I know about its culture, history, economy, and political system, I think China has just as much revolutionary potential as anywhere else. But the revolution that Mao led is over. My knowledge on China is, of course, really limited, not because I haven't studied the political system and the history, which I have, but because it's so vast. How many years of study would it take you to say you know the history of China? How many different places would you need to spend time in to say you know China and its people? It's enormous. So no one can just explain China in a half-hour YouTube video. All I can do is say I saw nothing whatsoever in China to think it fits any definition of socialism I know about. You know, except the tautological one that defines socialism as China, the USSR, and so on. Many leftists, I don't know what proportion, would say Mao's China was socialist. We can argue about that if you want. I'm not going to be discussing Mao or his legacy for several reasons. And I'm not going to be saying China is worse than everywhere else. I won't be comparing it with anywhere. You don't need to. But if you notice any similarities with other countries, that's not a coincidence. China has the same problems as the rest of the capitalist world, and like in those places, the problems are not getting solved because people with money benefit. I'm talking about China here, but a lot of what I say can be applied to other states people call socialist or communist. I don't know a lot of the specifics of the history of the other so-called communist countries, but if you listen to enough anarchists from there or other real dissidents, not to be confused with dissidents being paid by the CIA, you can get a clear enough picture to see the Marxist-Leninist model is not so much a dictatorship of the proletariat as a straight-up dictatorship. That shouldn't be surprising if you know how the state works. All states are some degree of dictatorship. Some just tolerate more dissent than others. 
But if the new state is only better than the old because it puts more money into healthcare or something, was it really worth all the bloodshed to install it? Do you envision a global alliance of socialist states? Well, keep dreaming, because states are constantly at odds with one another. Being nominally socialist didn't stop Vietnam from invading Cambodia in December 1978 and China from invading Vietnam two months later. I expect someone can give reasons like to save communism in Indochina or something, but really it was because that's what the people running these states perceived as being in their interest. No states would ever really implement communism because no one with the power to do that would just eliminate their source of power like that. States benefit from everything communism seeks to destroy. So I don't believe what these states say about themselves, which is why I don't care as much as some people think I should about statistics. They can be so misleading. Statistics tend to lend the appearance of science to prejudices and propaganda. They're easily made up, but even when they aren't, they don't necessarily mean what the people citing them say, and they tell us nothing of context or causes. If we uncritically believe statistics and listen to other people's assessment of them, we could believe just about anything. I bring up statistics because that's always the first stop for people. China has raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Or if you're a liberal, Chinese capitalism has raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Those numbers are suspect. You need to believe the state is telling the truth and that the official poverty lines are accurate and useful measures of poverty. Here's a video on why they usually aren't. It was all done by capitalist means, wasn't it? How has anyone risen out of poverty in a way different from any other capitalist state that creates a middle class? In other words, by receiving a higher percentage of capitalist plunder. And are they really out of poverty? Like, when did they come out of poverty, exactly? There are still poor and homeless people in, in China. They're still working crushing 12-hour days in factories and offices and fields. Which metrics do you use to say they're not poor anymore? Because I see even socialists trying to persuade me China is socialist by using GDP and salaries. It's like they want to prove capitalism is productive. And like it always does, unfettered capitalism in China has wrecked the environment. Ultimately, you're making the same claims capitalism makes about its ability to lift people out of poverty while just moving wealth around, not spreading it to everyone. What's the purpose of eliminating poverty, or claiming to, if not to eliminate problems like long work hours and financial insecurity? When people say those people found their way out of poverty, they might just mean they've integrated into the global market. Well, here's what I saw anyway. Again, there are plenty of poor people and unhoused people and they don't have a social safety net. They struggle. Many of those struggling are migrant workers, and even though they were born in China, they're considered migrant workers just because they're from a different province. I don't think they're counted by the statistics at all, actually, because of the HUCO system. And yet we're talking about a couple of hundred million people. If you don't know what a hukou is, there's a link in the description, but basically it's a system for restricting the movement of labor, and thereby leading millions of people to the life of a poor, illegal, urban laborer. There are also lots of rich people there. You can go into super luxury stores in any big city in China, but you won't see homeless people outside begging because the police have long since cleared them away. Like all bourgeois states, the police serve the rich and use violence against the poor so they're no inconvenience. By the way, you know who created that wealth and luxury, right? It wasn't magic. It was poor workers who have nothing. Marx said, accumulation of wealth at one pole is at the same time accumulation of misery, agony of toil, slavery, ignorance, brutality, mental degradation at the opposite pole. And it's just as clear in China as anywhere else. 
There are millions of people vending things in the streets in China, and they're terrified of the police because they know the police can do whatever they want to them. I've seen street vendors scatter because one of them said the police were coming. I've seen them get arrested for nothing. Maybe they just weren't supposed to be there. I've seen police destroy their tiny businesses because they thought it didn't look good for tourists. Do those people show up in your poverty statistics? I also saw people lose their homes and businesses just because some rich guy wanted their space. For instance, one night I went for a haircut in this one building near my apartment. Yes, this was a long time ago. They didn't know their building would be torn down the next morning. But on a whim, the bulldozers came and they destroyed the building. Then whoever owned it didn't even build anything on the place where they destroyed other people's businesses for the whole rest of the time I was in that neighborhood. Because capitalists, including bosses and landlords, have the power in China. Just like they do wherever you live. I'm sure things were a bit different during Mao's time, but this is the age of Dungism, which is China's neoliberalism. Yet to hear some leftists praise China, you'd think there were no problems there. According to them, there's no discontent in China. Almost everyone is happy with the state. No, there are protests in China all the time. More against local government than federal, but then that's because any chance at building a bigger movement gets crushed. Which of the communist theorists that you've read say you should shit on popular protest if you really like the state? It's typical state behavior. Any potential threat to the established order gets arrested. There's plenty of discontent in China, and downplaying it shows you're not interested in popular struggle, but just lining up behind the powerful. We've got enough people doing that already. But I guess the same people who call every protest against a regime they like a CIA color revolution might just not understand that people have agency. The 2019 protests in Hong Kong were informed by the fact that the extradition bill that triggered the uprising would have given the government of China the power to arrest Hong Kongers for the same trifles they arrest people for on the mainland, like spreading disharmony. I didn't hear many China-humping leftists mention that, presumably because they didn't know how people felt and just got their impressions from the photos they saw. Every state and its media accuse some social movement that opposes them of being a beneficiary of foreign meddling, and sometimes all it takes for outsiders to believe them is a photo taken out of context or a misleading Chow Collective article. I need more evidence before I reject a legitimate social movement. So where's the socialism? Where's the common ownership of the means of production? Where's the right to criticize, organize, and strike? Is there any workers' control? Or do we just assume the party is the workers, so we don't have to think about it? I've heard people say, oh, you silly Western left bides was, don't understand the CPC is the biggest communist organization in the world. Assuming, because of its name, Everyone in it must be a committed commie. Did you know they let business owners become members of the party? Do you really think people join the party because they want to advance communism? Or might they just be networking? Marx said the goal was to abolish private property, because only then would we no longer be alienated from our labor. The CPC owns a lot of the means of production, but it's not subject to popular control, so they get used to make the rich richer. From an article I linked to down below. With the benefits of hindsight, it can be demonstrated that actually existing socialism ironically prepared some of the key ingredients responsible for its own eventual mutation into capitalism. That is to say, it achieved certain crucial yet incomplete functions of original or primitive accumulation needed for the later restoration of capitalism. First, by reproducing the dominated and appropriated status of the working population, and second, by vesting a powerful state that was not democratically accountable with control of the social means of production. The final flowering of this evolutionary process has to await some specific 
conjuncture of auspicious global and domestic social conditions. With the systematic enclosure of public assets and their conversion en masse into private capital by those who control political power, the immense wealth appropriated and accumulated during the previous decades is being drawn into the circuit of capitalist production and distribution. I see little reason to believe the CPC is building productive forces with the eventual goal of adopting socialism and then communism. Capitalism leads to more capitalism until people rise up and overthrow it. Most leftist arguments in favor of China seem to be that it's not as bad as the US and other major powers. We should support China because the terms of its loans aren't as bad as the IMF's. It supports despotic governments, but it doesn't invade. It occasionally executes bankers instead of letting them dictate policy. It's raising wages for some workers. If these are your reasons to support China, then you're a liberal, not a socialist, because these are liberal criteria. Socialists oppose capitalism, not just its worst offenders, not just its excesses, not just locally. I think one reason leftists support China is the need to believe in identifiable wins and winners. It's less about what's right and more about what's a bit better. They're committed to the competitive, lesser evil framework that we're brought up on. And as you might know if you've ever seen people discuss politics, that little bit better can be the basis of extreme loyalty to a team and bitter rivalries with people on opposing teams. In the case of China, one might support the whole country, which I've always thought is impossible because it's a country, so it has like a billion different people with different interests. Or you could support the state or the oppressed people of China. I think the ideal is the latter. Support oppressed people in China like everywhere else. That's why if, say, the U.S. invaded the Chinese mainland and tried to occupy it, it would be easy to pick sides in that fight. It's clear the U.S. would be the aggressor and the occupier. Well, it's not occupying China and probably never will again. And China doesn't need the support of YouTubers in Ushankas to fend it off right now. Your efforts will be better spent listening to people who are resisting, not just assuming whatever said to discredit them is valid. People who believe the Chinese Communist Party is actually working towards socialism and communism are committing what I call the poli 101 fallacy, believing a government's words despite its actions to the contrary. I hear American leftists repeat all the government propaganda and think they're smart because they're not American nationalists. It's not propaganda when it comes from China, you see, for whatever reason they give, and you're a racist for thinking they might be employing time-honored political rhetoric to mask their intentions. Are they really building up productive forces with the intention of implementing socialism? So ownership of the means of production are concentrated in the hands of the capitalist class, which is now encouraged to join the CPC. But one day the CPC will order the People's Liberation Army to seize all their assets and redistribute them to the people. Do you really believe that? Do you believe one day they'll lift up the poor and stop expropriating the working class? If so, I kind of think your beliefs are based on faith. Not facts. It's a neoliberal state with more state ownership than the other which is presumably why it supports other neoliberal states. The Chinese government has effectively financed the U.S.'s wars over the past 20 years. It works closely with Israel, you know, an apartheid state that the left has agreed it opposes, I thought. They sell arms and technology to each other. One implication for us is that a weaker China would mean a weaker United States or Israel or any of its trade partners. The same leftists who scoff when they hear propaganda from the US or UK lap it up when China says the same thing. They talk about the Uyghurs and say, oh, those, those camps, they're to re-educate and prevent terrorism. 
Oh yeah? Where where have I heard that one before? Maybe I'm just old enough to remember the rhetoric of the War on Terror. Now there's a chance, albeit a slim one, China will invade Taiwan. And thousands of ignorant leftists will encourage it. They'll say, hey, Taiwan belongs to China. And that's it. That's all they need to approve invading, occupying, and annexing tens of millions of people. Then they'll continue to call themselves anti-imperialists without seeing the irony. They don't believe in human lives or freedom. They just want state supremacy, as long as the state flies a red flag. But I guess it's not surprising. They might call themselves socialists, but they're Americans. You know, not to talk about all Americans, but lots of Americans insist on having opinions on things they know nothing about. I've even heard them called Taiwan fascist. They're like 40 years too late with that take. Can't they just shut up about things they don't understand? Maybe read and listen and reflect on the issue. Maybe some of the links in the description? instead of parroting the CPC line? If you're really a socialist, why not argue for the demilitarization of China and the US and elsewhere, instead of the opposite, arguing for more war? How many people is it okay to kill and imprison in the name of one guy's plan? I don't accept that saying something against the CPC is dividing the left, since the CPC is not leftists. It's the same with these supposed leftists who love Bashar al-Assad. The guy's one of the worst mass murderers of this century so far, and we're expected not to say anything because authoritarian leftists say, he's one of us. You can have him. He's not a leftist either. It's saying anything, any of this is actually divisive. It's dividing the people who think we should continue to push for socialism and the power of the people from those who think we should put our faith into capitalist states. Let's drop this need to side with capitalists because one is slightly better than the other while doing nothing to further our goals. Otherwise, we have no goals. No revolution will be contained in one country. It needs to take place everywhere, wherever there's oppression. China is divided into classes like everywhere else. The lower classes should be overthrowing the ruling class everywhere. It could start in China. Maybe it already has. I don't know. All I know is the conflict is not between China and the United States or the West. It's not geographic regions inevitably at odds. It's between the people who own everything and the rest of us.